Gupta is one of the stalwarts and a visionary for the students of microbiology and biological sciences. It is a great honor to introduce him today in our webinar series. Professor Sujay Das Gupta did his graduation in chemistry honors from St. Javier's College, Kolkata, followed by his post-graduation from Department of Biochemistry, University of Calcutta. He obtained his PhD from Bose Institute in the year 1989 under the able mentorship of Professor Late R.K. Mondol. Professor Das Gupta did his postdoctoral work at the University of Texas Health Center at Tyler, USA, understanding how the growth of certain DNA viruses such as mouse polyoma virus gets restricted is in undifferentiated cell, but not in differentiated one. After that, he was a postdoctoral fellow at University College Delhi South Campus, where he initiated the study of mechanism by which microbacterial promoter functioned and used this information to develop a vector which would transform the microbacterial gene as well as express these genes efficiently. In 1994, Professor Das Gupta joined Bose Institute as a faculty member. Currently, he is working with the mycobacteriophages that infect and kill mycobacteria. The ultimate objective of this research is to use this knowledge and deliver for the development of novel therapeutics for TB. Apart from this program, Professor Das Gupta has also been the principal investigator of multicentric multi program, New Millennium India Technology Leadership Initiative or NMITLI project on latent tuberculosis. And its target new drug designing as well as bioenhancers and therapeutic designing as well as uh, research, which is a CSIR project sanctioned in 2001. While executing project, Professor Das Gupta had been the lead scientist at Bose Institute to perform research in the area of drug development, as well as he has been, he has filed several international patents and publications. Professor Das Gupta, welcome you sir and once again, the stage is now yours. Thank you, Dr. Indra Lipor and uh, Dr. Uh, Devdit, Devdit Das Gupta. I'm very glad that Surendranath College has organized this and they are, they are organizing this series of, pro of programs on uh, COVID-19. I'm very impressed uh, with how uh, Surendranath College microbiology department faculty members are taking interest in the, this subject. Well, this corona pandemic, yes, uh, this has been a tragic circumstances which has affected all of us. Uh, we are unable to do our research and everything, uh, but uh, uh, this is probably a time when we should think more about viruses, not just from the pandemic point of view. Yes, viruses, uh, this particular virus is causing a lot of agony for us. Uh, but I, I, am I audi audible? Everybody can hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, so it is very important to realize that uh, viruses are there everywhere, and there are so many types of viruses which we have not discovered uh, ever discovered. So, trying to learn about viruses only when there is a pandemic is probably uh, counterproductive. Since you are all uh, microbiology students uh, involved in microbiology, uh, I thought I would give you some kind of a general lecture of viruses. Uh, rather than the, the COVID-19, rather than the coronavirus itself. I'm sure you must be having, listening to so many virus, uh, seminars and talks and listening to the, about coronavirus all that time. So therefore I have titled my talk as uh, reconnecting with our viral ancestors. Uh, it is not directly linked to the COVID-19 pandemic, but I hope uh, this will give you some insight. Just as uh, Dr. Indranilipal mentioned, that uh, it is really surprising that we, we cannot ask, we cannot say whether say whether viruses are live or alive. So even defining the virus has become so difficult. So yet, even though uh, these viruses we consider them as uh, as uh, not alive or something like that, yet see how much of agony 
uh, they are causing. So at the end of it, probably we should uh, think in a broader way about viruses so that after this pandemic, if this pandemic is over, uh, we can have a much better insight, particularly about the evolutionary aspect of viruses. Where have they come from? What are they doing? So these are certain issues that I would like to take up. And so, I, so may I start my uh, slide presentation? Is it okay? Yeah, can I share my screen now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you can. Okay, so I believe that you can uh, see my screen now. And I believe that you can uh, see my uh, slides. Yes, sir, we can. We all can. Okay. So the title of my talk is Reconnecting uh, with Our Viral Ancestors. And I am Sujay Dasgupta. I am from Bose Institute. And uh, this is our emblem. And this is the old campus at, uh, at Raja Bajar. And our institute was founded by the uh, Doyen of uh, Indian Science, uh, Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose, almost 104 to 5 years ago. So I'm very proud to be associated with this, with this institute, and particularly the Department of Microbiology. So starting off with this issue that uh, Yes, so, so how do we talk about viruses? Yes, we can regard them as uh, organisms at the age of life. And when we talk about viruses, we can, you know, what comes into our mind is that they cause, cause so much of pain. Even before this coronavirus, you know, HIV was such a huge problem. Hepatitis is such a huge problem. Even recently, uh, Ebola, adenovirus, uh, these were such uh, uh, such very uh, very important issues. So it is not that it is only during these times that a virus has creating havoc. Havoc. You know about all these diseases. Uh, fortunately, these were not as much transmissible, transmissible as the coronavirus, and that is why probably uh, probably uh, it was. Now we do not uh, think about them very much. But if you consider HIV, for example, today yes, coronavirus is still killing so many. But those who have survived the virus, probably they, the, they are not, they do not have so much of uh, symptoms. Many are getting cured. But you take HIV, for example, somebody is infected with HIV, uh, is destined to die, no matter what kind of treatment is done. So yes, viruses have been there, but it is not rational to think that, that the objective of the virus is to kill uh, humanity or, or to, so they are not, we should not regard them as some kind of a, of devils, instead of let's take up a very uh, scientific point of view about what these things are, are doing. And so uh, let's try to go a little bit ahead. Well, this is nothing to do with virology or anything. This is a slide that uh, that I show all, all the time. This is about a, about a storybook that I had read uh, when I was young. It is called The Roots. It was written by an American uh, uh, author. Uh, named uh, Alex Alex Haley. The the reason why I show you this slide is that we are all interested uh, to know about our past. Okay, I would like to know who was my grandfather or who was my great grandfather. So we are always curious to know about our ancestor. And uh, and this is the story about Alex uh, Haley, who was a colored American, uh, and uh, he he could taste you know by uh, by the, you know, by taking into account all the stories that are available from his cousins and all that he knew, knew about his past, he could build a tree and he could find. Uh, is it visible? That is the whole, my, is my whole slide visible? By the way. Yes, sir. It's visible. The whole slide is visible. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So, so he could discover that uh, that uh, he and his cousins were a descendant of a, of a of an uh, of an african uh, you know of an, of an african slave whose name was punta quinte so this is how we have to look into our past okay so we need to look into whatever is there at present and try to build up a kind of tree uh, so that we can uh, find out uh, from where we have started who was our great grandfather or who was uh, even before that. 
so this desire to look into our ancestors is is all pervading almost many scientists have tried to do that and probably the the, the most outstanding of them is of course uh, charles darwin so just like Al alex haley made this uh, what you call this uh, tree of life alex uh, the, the his family tree charles darwin has proposed that the tree of life which all of you know about and which i would not go into details uh, but uh, later on uh, carl woos had uh, but later on carl woos had developed this molecular phylogeny now the basic thing about all these phylogenies is that is that it is uh, it is assumed that we all cellular organisms we all cellular organisms must have uh, you know must have uh, been created or must have evolved you know, from a common ancestor what was that common ancestor or ancestor how was it like we have absolutely no idea it could have been a cellular organism it could be something else but one thing we have here, we are we are very certain is that we all must have must be coming from the same ancestor because for example we have the same similar kind of ribosomal rna genes we have similar kind of rak proteins so if you look at all the cellular organisms unicellular bacteria they are all different but they are very similar in many many ways so this is the story about the about the cellular organisms or like bacteria etc but what about viruses now this is a this is a major issue so we have no idea about 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 from about the evolution of viruses okay why because because we cannot have in, unlike in the case of of cellular organisms it is not possible to find out any particular common gene uh, with the help of which uh, we can we can trace the evolution of the viruses and but still as we know as we are realizing now that that there is and also also there is a huge number of genes that are present in viruses that are not present in cellular organisms so therefore we can refer to this virus as some kind of a dark matter about which we have, we know very little and yet they are so much abundant in the on our surface they are present everywhere and uh, and so so therefore we we need to try to understand about about uh, about how viruses came on to the uh, evolved on on our on our earth so our discussion will be centered around uh, this particular question that do they have ancestors too and uh, the probably probably uh, you know the, the the viruses are so so diverse but interestingly almost every domain of life be it bacteria archaea or eukarya uh, possesses uh, have have their own virus so therefore there is a, there must be some common ancestor uh, for all these viruses and there are many other evidences also thus for example after a, you know if you if you look at the capsid structure of many of these viruses for example on your left you see the capsid structure of a on the or the coat protein structure of a of a virus called bacterial virus called prd1 and on your right you see the coat protein structure of a virus the adenovirus now in the in terms of uh, amino acid sequence homology there is very little if any similarity between these two uh, these two coat proteins but but if you look at the structure if you crystallize these proteins and look at their structure then you will find that there is a some kind of a common fold that is present in both prd1 as well as adenovirus and this common fold is sometimes called a jelly roll protein a jelly roll structure okay so this is a protein structure called the jelly roll, roll structure this structure is present in both of them so although there is no there is no no sequence similarity yet people are be believe that a, a virus that infects a bacteria may have some distant relationship with a virus that infects human being uh, such as adenovirus so in this way people are trying to see whether at least whether some groups of viruses can be classified uh, maybe having a, a some kind of a, of the same ancestor so we go into into the uh, in the other kind of classification 
so this is a very interesting classification which shows which shows that that uh, this is an attempt to try to bring different groups of viruses into 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 specific groups for example for example uh, this part in this particular group what you see these images are very interesting if you see here that uh, the uh, the size of this uh, you know these uh, icons represent uh, the uh, these icons represent uh, the organisms that these viruses uh, infect for example uh, this is uh, the metazoa so this is for example a metazoa that means this particular group of viruses infect metazoa they infect bacteria they infect unicellular eukaryotes and plants this particular group uh, also including it also infects fungus this particular group does not infect uh, so bacteria and so on and so forth and the size of this icon you can see is, is very so that means that means that uh, it shows the number of viruses that infect so size is proportional to the number of viruses so anyway so what you see here is that is that is that these viruses can be classified into similar viruses based on on the on the rna polymerase the rna dependent rna polymerase uh, or the or this or the jelly roll port protein okay so as i just now said so all these viruses are have some kind of a similarity they use rna dependent rna polymerase something that the coronavirus also does so and also they have this common jelly roll port protein so even though these viruses are infecting very different types of living organisms yet it appears that they must have had a similar kind of kind of origin similarly you have the other case of the retrons or the retroviruses so in this case also you can see that these retroviruses they may infect different different organisms but they all depend on this reverse transcriptase for the activity plasmids plasmids are are younger brothers of viruses plasmids are like viruses which have lost all the port protein they only have the dna and so you can see that in the in the case of plasmids and viruses many of them replicate by the rolling circle model and finally there are plasmids which replicate to what is called the very interesting enzymes called the primase polymerases so therefore even though these viruses have nothing in common they infect so many different it is possible to group them under under certain groups depending on this on the similar certain similarities and these are called hallmark proteins that is proteins that allow you to classify viruses in particular groups these are called the hallmark proteins if you go to the, the go to the what is known as the baltimore classification you can see a similar phenomena where you can see different that, that although there are so many viruses you can group them into seven groups de depending on the whether they are they are using dna as their genomic material or rna as their genomic material so if you should notice one thing irrespective of whatever genomic material they had they must produce their ma mature messenger rna from which the proteins will have to be produced okay so now here is a big problem now here is a big problem that who are we and what are them okay so it is become a us versus them like today uh, today we are really fighting an unknown enemy the unknown enemy so so we need to so who is this enemy who is this enemy how do we define our enemy the virus so so therefore we need to think about this issue that what is them yes there is some difference between them and us so what is different between what is that source of the difference now it is interesting that um, that there are many viruses have been discovered have been discovered which are so large which are really large for example these are known as mini viruses okay so these mini viruses are so large that they almost look like cellular organisms and they have genes for various different types of of uh, of uh, uh, you know enzymes and proteins etc including say say uh, trans translation transcription uh, chromatin assembly so they have so many so many kinds of genes almost like us okay so the viruses have almost this virus has almost like us almost all the genes 
But what does it not have? And what do we have? And what do we, we have that they do not have? The answer is probably that we maybe you can classify all living organisms. So we now consider virus two as a living organism. Only difference is that is that the virus is an organism that doesn't have ribosomes and they have capsids. And the other way around, we are organisms. We miss all the cellular cellular forms of life are organisms which have ribosomes, but they do not have capsid. So for every every a domain of life, there will be the ribosome encoding organisms and there will be the capsid encoding or organisms. So they go hand in hand. So by this definition, we should consider that the viruses are a, are a form of life and we and the viruses go hand in hand. So, okay, so we are partners in the process of life, not antagonists to each other, though unfortunately, Right now, it is not fair to call them uh, antagonists. They are, they are our enemy. But evolutionarily, if you look at that, uh, the situation, probably uh, where the, the viruses and, uh, and cellular organisms are essentially uh, two sides of the, of the same coin. So having said that, having said that, uh, am I audible and visible everywhere? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are perfectly audible and visible. Okay, thank you. Your slides are visible nicely. Okay, okay. So therefore, maybe we should go back uh, to the to the origin of life. Okay. So if you go back to the origin of life, uh, our Earth, our Mother Earth, was created maybe approx approximately 4.5 billion ago, and then we had water something about 4.2 billion er years uh, ago. And then there was the prebiotic chemistry where small, small compounds were formed. So if you uh, remember the Miller and Urey experiment, uh, if you take all these various gases, say, uh, you know, ammonia and uh, et cetera, et cetera, and put, put them into a vessel, and if you spot them, you will find in this particular uh, solid, in the, in the soup, in the soup or solution, many of the organic compound, compounds that we know are, are involved in living processes. So it is believed that, that for a long time, there was a lot of lightning and rain and all those kinds of things. And as those things happened, these molecules were formed. And once these molecules were formed, these, these, uh, uh, these are small, small organic molecules are formed. And many of these organic molecules had the capacity to, uh, to be formed what is called multimers. And some of them form what is Called the, called the RNA molecules. So these RNA, these RNAs that were formed, say, around this world, the RNA has a very unique capacity. The RNA can, can perform as a template, like a DNA, like a, the storage material for, for a genetic code, as well as the RNA, which has got this, uh, this uh, two prime hydroxy end, it can also function as an enzyme. So RNA is a very uh, peculiar kind of molecule which can not only function as the genetic material, but it can also function as a, uh, what you call the, as, a, as an enzyme. So it is believed that because, uh, so, so what is life all about? Life is all about having a genetic material and having some enzymes that they can do the work and they, those enzymes should be coded by the genetic material. So if you look at the RNA, RNA is a, is a jack of all trades. It can, it can, it can function as a, genetic material it can also function it can also function as a uh, what you call it can also function as an enzyme so therefore therefore there are very, very substantial reasons to believe that are that the first genome the first form of life was a simple rna molecule uh, which suddenly discovered that it can replicate replicate itself so in this way the rna world was formed then the DNA world was formed. And then of course, after diversification, we have this particular form of life, as I'm talking to you, the very intelligent form of life. So this RNA, this RNA world is very, very important for us. And you can, as you can see that uh, this RNA world is still here. It has not gone away. And uh, today we are realizing how much uh, powerful this RNA world is because uh, all these viruses 
not only the coronaviruses, uh, the retroviruses, the rhabdoviruses, they are all RNA viruses, and uh, their mechanism of of action, the mechanism by which replicate, are so unique that that even after so much of of scientific uh, efforts, we have been unable to produce a single drug that can inhibit their their uh, their multiplication. That can inhibit their their multiplication. So uh, so yes so. So then the question is, question is, uh, can we have some kind of a theory uh, in which maybe viruses can be considered as our ancestors? And that is in the, uh, in the shown in the next slide. This is what the, the two theories, one is by, by uh, Dr. Eugen Kunin. He's a, he's a very famous bioinformatics who has done extensively work on the, on the homology of various genes and proteins, et cetera. And here we have Dr. Patrick Fortier, uh, who, is a, who is a more of an evolutionary microbiologist. So the theories that are going around is that, is that maybe, maybe long time back, these RNA molecules, there was no cell. These RNA molecules got entrapped in what is called inorganic compartments, okay? So if you go into any pond or any water body, you will find a spontaneous formation of various inorganic compartments. And these small molecules had the capacity to migrate from one compartment to another. And these are called selfish, uh, selfish ribozyme type of, of uh, molecules, which could, which could do both. That is uh, uh, function as a genetic material, as well as function as an enzyme. Well, sometimes it so happened that, uh, that many of these of these RNA molecules, they combine together for, to form so large molecules which could not migrate from one compartment to another. But some of them retain the capacity to migrate from one compartment to another. These larger species, they actually became the, what is called the nuclear DNA, whereas the smaller ones which could migrate, they remain the, what you call the viruses. So in this way, so in this way, from the RNA world, the RNA protein world was born, and then the RNA to DNA transition took place. Then we had the DNA world, and then we have all these all these viruses. So this explains why all the all the uh, the compartments of life, all the the domains of life, uh, have these uh, viruses. So in this particular theory, we can see that we don't need a, our ancestor need not have been a cellular a cellular organism. Uh, so therefore, maybe our the the first living molecule was an RNA, and from that RNA, all these various uh, uh, you know living forms have evolved. And there are other alternative theories. For example, here it is the theory is that is that maybe at some point of time, various primitive type of cells existed. Okay, so they are all cells, but they are primitive cells. One of them, one of them had some particular characteristic which made them much more uh, aggressive or much more competent to multiply than the others, okay? So, so this particular uh, cell probably invented what is known as a ribosome. And once it invented a ribosome, it became a kind of uh, cellular organism and it started multiplying, uh, multiplying at a great speed. What would happen for the other, other primitive cells? They were completely left out they had no other options to become parasites. And in this way, uh, these became viruses and these became uh, cellular organisms. So these are certain intriguing theories about, about how viruses must have, must have emerged. Although it is not possible to find out absolute evidence, these are certain uh, theories that people can have been working on. And many of you can think about how to uh, develop these theories and uh, investigate uh, the role of viruses in the origin of life. Now, coming to this, uh, this, uh, uh, this, uh, this chicken and egg problem is going to remain forever. Okay, so did the viruses come first, or did the cellular organisms come first? So, uh, so, so this problem. So, some people will say that the viruses evolved from cellular organisms, and other people will say that no viruses evolved. Uh, the cellular organisms evolved from viruses. Now to resolve this question, who came first? 
uh, we can make an argument. For example, if you see the viral world, including plasmids, you will find that there are various kinds of replication intermediates. The black ones are DNA, the gray ones are RNA. So for example, you can have single standard RNA to, uh, to double standard RNA to single standard RNA. You can have, uh, have DNA to, you know, DNA, RNA hybrid and so on and so forth. You can have RNA to DNA. So you can see that viruses have got so many different types of mechanisms to replicate their genetic material. Whereas cells have only one type of mechanism that is DNA, double standard DNA to double standard DNA. So this leaves open the question that if that is so, if viruses have so many different mechanisms of replication, then how can they be produced from the, uh, from the DNA world or from the cellular organism? If, if a virus is produced directly from a, from a DNA cell, then it would have only the DNA type of replication. Whereas in this case, we find that the virus have so many different types of replications, including the coronavirus, which has got a RNA, RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So the variety of replication uh, uh, mechanisms in viruses suggest that they may, may be having a different evolutionary history uh, compared to uh, cellular organisms. Okay. So, so then how did this, how did this DNA, DNA world evolve from viruses? So it, uh, here you can see that, that uh, we are trying to trace the origin of, of DNA-based life from RNA-based life. So the theory here is that, is that this RNA, viruses have RNA, and we all know that RNA is very unstable. So, so, uh, so nature started evolving, tried to evolve. Uh, the, so these RNA viruses, like the coronaviruses, they are dependent on RNA-dependent RNA polymerases, but then this is highly unstable. So what nature did is that it, that it evolved an enzyme called ribonucleate reductase, you know, which could convert the ribonucleotides to DXC ribonucleotides. And this we term as the uDNA. Why do we term it as a uDNA? Because, because this, this uDNA means that it has, it has uracil DNA. So even today, many organisms can have have uracil instead of thymine. But then it, it became, maybe nature found that uDNA is also unstable. So it invented what is called the, the thymidylate synthase. And now we have this tDNA instead of uDNA. So in this way, probably through evolution of this, uh, this uracil glycosylases and this, uh, the evolution of, of ribonectin reductase and thymidylate synthase, uh, through this evolution, we could create uh, this DNA world. But once this DNA virus evolved, the, the, so, so, so once this DNA virus has evolved, what is the evidence that, this, uh, that they contributed to the origin of, of the cellular form of the DNA forms of life? So in this case, you can see that, uh, that it is very interesting to know that the replication systems of, of cellular organisms is non-orthologous. That means that means if you take bacteria, archaea, and eukarya, all of them will require a, enzymes like a primase, a DNA polymerase, a helicase, and a clamp loader. But if, if you find that, that the DNA primase of a bacteria has a totally different evolutionary history, they are totally different from the uh, primase of archaea. So in the case of archaea, it is called the archaeo-eukaryotic primase, which is completely different from the DNAG types of uh, primase in bacteria. And similarly, similarly, DNA polymerase are also what are called non-orthologous. Helicase, for example, is DNA B in case of bacteria and the MCM in case of uh, other things. Only clamp loader uh, is the same in both of them. So which means that, that what is the origin of this non-orthology? So that means different branches of life must have evolved their, their DNA uh, replication mechanisms uh, differently. So to, in order to explain this, we can have a, this kind of an explanation. Here, what we are seeing is that, if you look over here, this is called non-orthologous gene displacement. So that means originally there was a particular type of, uh, the, say the, the RNA type of cell, 
and then what these viruses did they kicked out that original form of of, uh, of of the genome and replaced it by a dna genome so in this way a uh, different uh, that they, although all these uh, these forms of life evolved from a common ancestor this uh, these viruses played a key role in in forcing the forcing them to have different types of 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 genes like the uh, the primases etc etc so these viruses may themselves may have contributed towards the evolution of uh, of various replication systems so this is uh, this is how the theory that stands right now that uh, that uh, that this is the this was this is the uh, the viral world and this is the rna world once upon a time then this rna world they introduce these viruses introduce the various types of genomes into bacteria archaea at different times of the evolution like as it's so shown here that initially they had this rna world but these phages broke the grow out the rna genomes and then the dna world was was formed so these are some of the theories that uh, that explain how viruses may have driven Uh, the evolution of the uh, of the of the of these uh, cellular world or the dna world so this is again a summary of what i have discussed here we show that the original rna cell was there the dna virus entered and it reverse transcribed the the rna and then it produced the dna based world some of these viruses they could not do anything so they just shed their uh, their outermost coat protein and uh, they they became what is called called plasmids so now now let's uh, go into a little bit in a different direction uh, what is called the uh, i call the uh, the mementos from the last universal uh, or the the relics of the past what we see here is that is that uh, is that that if you go to the various relics for example this is the uh, the ruins of the in pompeii or the ruins of the nalanda if you look at those ruins if you look at those ruins you will find that uh, that that from those ruins you can exactly say how the people live what the people is to do and so on and so forth so these are the relics of the past so maybe and uh, this is a very interesting saying which says that the past is never dead it's not even past so whatever there was the was in the past we can find their their footprints even at the present uh, present times like we find it in the case of various uh, relics of the past like uh, like uh, the ruins of nalanda or ruins of the pompeii and so on and so forth so we will now discuss how these viruses and plasmids uh, can be uh, considered as mementos from the last universal common ancestor so if you study these plasmids and viruses maybe we'll come to know a lot about how life was long long time back maybe even before uh, before uh, the, the 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 what you call life started the origin of life on earth so we'll i'll give you some examples about this relics of this past and uh, this one is a very recent recent uh, finding you know that uh, it's, uh, that uh, really it's you know we are always thinking we are going to mars and everywhere you know it, it's a common feeling it's a very lonely feeling particularly today when this virus is attacking us are we completely alone in this whole universe don't you have any brother sister friends or anybody in another planet or another universe or another galaxy maybe so maybe if they were there they could have helped us today so people are always thinking that that if life had been originated in earth it must have also originated in other planets also so they are constantly looking for evidence of life through various mechanisms like uh, like uh, trying to uh, send rockets and all that or trying to find out various signals that are coming from outer space but uh, there's another way to looking look at it. some of this uh, this uh, what we call this carbonaceous uh, meteorites okay so what are meteorites they are they are small they are rock like things that that come onto the surface of the earth and they come from very very distant places sometimes from our our planetary systems and sometimes maybe from other places also and so one such meteorite uh, you know people can actually see these meteorites falling 
and one such meteorite fell in, in a in a in a in a village or town in Australia known as Mochison, and that meteorite is known as Mochison meteorite. People have analyzed the chemistry of this Mochison's meteorite, and they could find they could find signatures or molecules that may have formed seven billion years ago. So so even before the formation of Earth, Earth was formed 4.5 billion years ago, and there are evidences that molecules that have were formed seven billion years ago are present in this in this particular meteorite. So this meteorite has come from outer space, and they are analyzing the chemistry of this meteorite. So when they analyzed this chemistry, they found that that there are uh, that there are many different organic molecules, including uh, some of these uh, these bases, these which constitute our uh, <coughs> our uh, DNA or RNA, like purine, adenine. Surprisingly, some of them have a different type of purine, such as the 2,6-diaminopurine, which is very similar to adenine, but, uh, but it is slightly different. So, and, uh, and they could prove that, uh, that these, uh, these altered purines, purines are, not, are, are coming from the meteorite and not as a contamination of the earth supplies or so. So therefore, therefore, it is quite possible that the, the life that is exists in a, in a, in a, in a, another planetary system may not be having a, an AT or GC, but they may be having some different types of, of nucleobases, say like 2,6 diamino purine. So, that, but that is a speculation. But very recently, a very new, a very interesting discovery was made that, uh, that a particular phage uh, called uh, of a cyanophage, that is a bacteriophage, a bacteriophage that is a virus of the bacteria, so this cyanophage, which is a, uh, which is a, a virus that infects uh, cyanobacteria, this bacteriophage had in its DNA two amino adenine, two amino adenine, which is not present in any other living organism. And, and in recently it has been possible to demonstrate that not only this cyanophage, many other bacteriophages have this two amino adenine. So this two amino adenine give rise to a very interesting type of uh, type of hydrogen bonding in which uh, you have three hydrogen bonds between Z and T. So this is the analog of, this is the modified form of A, we call it Z. So just as A and T form two hydrogen bonds, Z forms, uh, forms three hydrogen bonds, uh, forms three hydrogen bonds. So, so they could discover if, uh, that these phages have got DNA, which has got Z, that is three hydrogen bonded DNA, unlike two hydrogen bonds and they call it the hardy genome. So if this is a different type of genome, one would expect that there must be uh, some specific enzymes in their genomes which should produce uh, this Z, uh, Z base, and they could actually identify a particular enzyme called pure, uh, pure Z, which is different from pure A that is required for the production of adenine. And also they could find a DNA polymerase which can, which can uh, use Z DNA uh, for uh, for this uh, uh, Z, Z nucleotides for the creation for the formation of the DNA. So therefore, by studying these bacteriophages, we can see that in the in this in this uh, viral world, there may be genomes that are totally different from the kind of genomes that we have in our body. So 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 this is a way. So this is how what I call the relic of the past that was discovered after so many so many years. So this the interesting aspect in this age of metagenomics, I'm sure you'll be finding many, many organisms having many, many different types of, of nucleic acid, uh, acid templates. And uh, maybe some of these have come from outer space. So this is one very recent finding that I was talking about. Well, there are, uh, maybe I can come a little bit into the type of work that I have been doing in my lab. And uh, just, to, just to give an example, about how interesting it is to do work in these evolutionary areas. So here I have to, we have found a sigma factor that participates in DNA replication. We all know that sigma factors are factors that are required for transcription. I'm, I'm sure you have never heard of sigma factor uh, participating in DNA replication. So we have been working with the plasmid, and as I told you, plasmids are younger brothers of viruses, and we are trying to find out how the two proteins, Rep A and Rep B, 
they function together to bring about the replication of this plasmid. And in trying to do so, we, could, we found that this uh, protein, RebB, goes and binds to an origin. And so all these kinds of things we have demonstrated, which, you, which I did not go into de detail. But we wanted to know that, that how does RebB and RepA cooperate with each other to, to bring about the replication of this plasmid. So when we did uh, some kind of a bioinformatic analysis, we found that this RebB, that which is a replication protein, it belongs to the to the family of what is called the sigma factors, and they are derived from the sigma four region. You know, the sigma factor has different different regions. They are derived from the sigma four region of the of the of the sigma factors, and you know, and this particular uh, RebB is, is forms a, forms a a helix turn helix. Now, helix turn helix is a uh, is a particular motif in which you have a the very basic structure of a helix turn helix protein is that there would be three helices: the 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 DNA recognition helix, the the, the locking helix, and the third helix. So this is the various uh, st basic structure. So in nature, you rarely find this basic structure. You only find various modifications of this helix turn helix family. But this is the first time we are reporting the existence of a of a helix turn helix helix family protein uh, as a, as an as an individual identity. So this was very encouraging to us, and we did some modeling, etc. And it appeared that that uh, this RebB, which is a replication factor, uh, is actually uh, is actually very similar to the uh, to the sigma factors. And then we went on to uh, to do a little bit more research work, which I will not go into details. And ultimately, what we proved, what we proved is that, is that as you know, the RNA polymerase uses sigma factor with the help of sigma factor is it goes and binds to the DNA. Very similarly, we could show that uh, that RebB, uh, which is a uh, which is a sigma factor like protein, it assists assists RebA to bind to the origin. So probably in ancient times, replication and trans transcription were very similar kind of phenomena, a similar kind of processes, and they were brought, uh, brought about by the, uh, by the same set of factors. So in this way, here we have in this plasmid a relic of the past, which can give you some example, some you know, new information about how replication and transcription systems uh, function in a very similar way uh, in, the, in the evolutionary past. We have also uh, found out some very another very interesting aspects about, about how pro, you know, operators, operators are, are DNA sequences where the repressor binds and promoters are DNA sequences where the RNA polymerase binds. So using another uh, viral uh, mycobacterial phage, uh, it was, has been reported that there are certain sequences here called uh, operators, so stop operator like sequences like operators, and they have a very common uh, structure. You know, they have this common uh, uh, structure, a uh, motif called TTGSCA. So we argued that this TTGSCA is also uh, also similar to the minus 35 sequence, and we argued that that these operator like elements may also be functioning uh, like uh, like promoters, and uh, in this way. Uh, we actually demonstrated that many of these operator-like elements can function also as promoters. So ultimately, we have come out with this theory that uh, that uh, if you look over here, that these operators, operator-like elements, promoter-like elements, they have all are descendants from a common DNA protein interaction module, and from them they have diverged in various directions. So these are certain examples of uh, my research work and the uh, research work done by others in the lab. What is very coming out, the message that is coming out from, the, from this research is that, is that the, the extreme diversity in the viral, viral, the viral domain, okay? So, so you can understand that, that even though we may be studying different forms of cellular life, life, some of them we are studying human, mouse, or bacteria, or fungus, or whatever it is, we are almost studying the same organism because they are all DNA-based life, but in viruses, there is so much heterogeneity uh, probably uh, by if I look if we keep on looking at these viruses, we'll come to know a lot about about how uh, the life originated of of art from very 
uh, very simple uh, simple molecules and maybe we can we will get the lead that some of these viruses may have even come from the from the outer space so with this uh, this little with this information uh, with this very complex kind of lecture i hope all of you could understand what i uh, i wanted to say but the very simple thing i wanted to say is that is the diversity of the viruses and the huge enormous problem that we we, we molecular biologists have to try to understand how these viruses are are multiplying at such a rapid rapid speed and you know these viruses don't really bother about about uh, about proofreading their genomes they are not really bothered if one or two mistakes come into their their genomes they are not bothered because even if even if one virus survives and one million viruses die that one virus that survives uh, is going to is going to create havoc uh, in every everywhere so that is what is happening the viruses are mutating very fast the viruses the rna polymerase is not very uh, error error uh, is not very error proof it introduces a lot of errors by introducing a lot of errors many of the viruses are becoming dead but those which are surviving will be creating waves of viruses continuously so we do not know what is the, you know, the our future is going to be uh, with this corona virus is uh, being around right right now we are seeing the second wave but as soon as the second wave comes down uh, the third wave may start uh, so many new variants will be created so it is really very challenging times for uh, for all of us particularly the younger generation uh, who are facing something uh, that we could not even imagine when we were we were young uh, so so i go, good luck to all of the younger students and the younger faculty members who need to have a we need to think out of the box if we keep on thinking every day about coronavirus then we'll never find out any remedy but if you look at the uh, try to understand the viral world as a uh, as a part of the living world then maybe some day some clue may be found about how to control them so with these words and uh, uh, so this is something i have already shown that uh, this is a summary of whatever i have discussed the origin of viruses is very intriguing viruses are more ancient than cellular organisms and viral and plasmid proteins can be regarded as, as mementos from the past so with these words and uh, thanking all my students who have contributed to the various research uh, i would like to thank all of you for your attention thank you thank you sir for such an insightful session and new updates on the viral evolution and its significance. We got a glimpse of some astrobiology, concepts of astrobiology and origin of life that is being emerging as a new subject. Uh, unless and until we understand the evolution, we cannot actually understand the pandemic. We understood the mechanism by which the viruses evolve over time. And we have seen some of those viruses are like extra behaving like an extraterrestrial. Okay, so now before going to the question and answer session, I would like to request all the participants who are watching us uh, fill this feedback form for today, uh, today's session. So this is available in your chat box, uh, either through Zoom interface or YouTube as well as Twitter. Uh, to issue the e-certificate, we would be needing this, your details. So please fill up the feedback form. Now we are coming to the most interesting part. Another interesting part of the uh, uh, lecture today is the question answer round. Uh, so I can see uh, I, I, a lot of questions are popping up in different windows. And uh, however, due to time constraints, we'll be able to take a few of them. And so today, so sir, Professor Dasgupta, shall we uh, pr proceed to the question answer session? Yes, yes, please go ahead, please go ahead. Okay, okay. So today's first question is, uh, is from, uh, okay, just a minute, uh, it is updating. Uh, there is no bona fide antiviral drugs. Do you believe studying the origin and evolution of virus would actually help uh, in developing the targeted drug discoveries for this virus? Yes, can I answer? Yes, sure, sir. Yes, definitely, definitely. Uh, we need to look very carefully uh, into the origin of the RNA dependent RNA polymerases. Okay, so these RNA dependent RNA polymerases are uh, very ancient, uh, ancient RNA polymerases, and uh, we need to do a lot of comparative analysis of the RNA dependent RNA polymerases and similar proteins. You know, many other proteins 
all of them i think i showed in a particular slide they have evolved from a what is called the rrm motif or rna recognition motif so definitely we need to study the evolution of the rna dependent rna polymerase and see uh, whether we can uh, create a new drug ramdesivir is probably is uh, one of the drugs that inhibits it uh, but uh, i'm sure by uh, looking into their uh, evolution we should be able to uh, find something new particularly the rna dependent rna polymerases right sir right sir uh, so uh, so the next question uh, that is uh, coming can we ever permanently get rid of sars cov 2 very open question see uh, we human beings have do not have so much of ability but uh, in nature in nature never uh, maintains a pandemic forever it is counter productive for the for the virus uh, to continue to create havoc in its uh, in its target population okay so at some point of the time uh, this virus will uh, will have will realize that if i keep on uh, restricting everybody at home uh, then its uh, own uh, own existence will be threatened so in any pandemic so this is the, not the first time that the pandemic has happened in any particular pandemic uh, we are uh, it definitely will happen that the virus uh, virus will go away from us but unfortunately unfortunately uh, probably it is not the virus itself which is creating problem it is how we are behaving and how we are fighting with each other i think the virus is taking advantage of all those kinds of a situation now if you look at the right, at the right. at the at the previous uh, previous uh, pandemic uh, the what is called the spanish flu okay so the spanish flu went away but at that time we did not have airports we did not have aeroplanes or uh, anything like that uh, we did not have uh, so many things huh? okay we did not have so much of politics so much of these things so you can see the spanish flu went away gradually uh but in this case uh, we are in a in a in a there has been a societal problem uh for due to which probably uh, it might take uh, some time for the virus uh, going away of course the vaccines will help but it will take time uh, to know whether the vaccines are how much they are working etc so right now everything is in a very cloudy situation but to answer your question evolutionarily see the viruses as i told you they have to the one thing is common to all viruses they cannot multiply by themselves so if they keep on killing and finishing uh, its hosts uh, then they will be they will not exist so it is like the like the what is called the prey and predator model you know if a, if a lion is there and it starts killing all the all the rabbits in there the rabbit population will go down right. then the rabbit the lion will feel sick and then the rabbit population right. will go up so in this way the virus may be going through a few cycles uh, but i'm sure that um, if we if uh, as a society uh, we are more careful or we do something sensible uh, probably the, this will definitely go away within a few months right right sir right sir so the same question like how long will it the same question is coming uh, again and again like how long will it take uh, to control this situation to normalize like do we expect a third wave or Uh, can we expect i can, i can understand even i am also saying the same thing from the morning uh, because yes no we cannot we should not be able to predict prediction is not going to help it is very difficult to predict what is happening uh, that will uh, although we want it to go immediately uh, but uh, even even those who have done so much of mathematical model modeling they also could not really visualize about what is happening because in any phenomena a natural phenomena is something different and the political and geo and societal phenomena is different it is very hard to give inputs about uh, you know uh, this kinds of behavior into your mathematical model and come out to a uh, conclusion but i believe uh, that uh, that uh, this should not go on for for a long time if you see in many of the european countries and even in usa you know, there has been a substantial drop it is not that not that even in china i don't know what is happening in china uh, it appears that they have controlled the controlled the virus because you know you may not you may be mis misreporting the number of cases but you cannot hide the number of deaths so the number of deaths is an indication how bad the situation is and i believe all over the world uh, there has been some degree of stabilization if you remember at the initial stages in italy uh, when we thought that this will never happen you know these uh, crematoriums were getting filled up 
the various patients were were lying in the uh, in the roadside and all those things of today italy and all those places have stabilized so we should be able to stabilize very soon but there has to be uh, some kind of a science be, uh, behind our uh, the way we behave we need to be a little bit scientific about the behave, way we behave uh, which is creating a, a some kind of a problem in our country uh, hopefully this problem will be solved okay sir so uh, so another question is coming uh, sir uh, shall we take one or two questions go ahead no problem okay okay sir uh, so uh, sir uh, would you please enlighten us about the triple mutant coronavirus whether the mutation will continue to take place in future also yes i have not i have not been able to study the where those mutations are taking place uh, we need to look at at, at which positions uh, those uh, mutations are taking place maybe the other two speakers uh, particularly partho uh, partho sarathi will be able to tell you much better now the thing is that that has those mutation affected some function uh, like the receptor function etc so so that link between the mutation and the and the uh, ability of the virus to survive is not clear uh, so right, so right, yes uh, right sir now the epidemiology suggests as far as i understand that the mutant viruses are are uh, multiplying at a, at a more rapid rate uh, compared to the uh, the original virus now what is the reason for this that we that we need to uh, need to understand so for example it can so happen that most of us are already carrying antibodies to the original virus and and so the original virus uh, if it infects we can resist but the virus has in the mutant mutated and then it is uh, it is going at a rapid space uh, because the original virus cannot replicate uh, so uh, we need to study the molecular biology of this triple mutation i have not been able to go through these details neither i am an expert so you need to ask the questions to maybe right, your right, professor sir. he will be able to tell you better right definitely sir definitely uh, sir i uh, will go for the last two questions uh, i have uh, one is very interesting uh, the one is like uh, the covid affected person uh, can this uh, if the if the person they, uh, took the vaccine is it possible that he is getting an, a, infected again suppose he he is covid infected he got a vaccine also but again uh, he got cured now is it possible that he will again uh, from a perspective that he will again infect, give, be infected see the vaccination vaccination is a very very difficult uh, has been a very difficult story for all vaccines there has been various ups and downs and uh, you know it is not absolutely possible to explain the mechanism by which a vaccine acts for example in case of tuberculosis uh, there was a complete general belief that vaccination with bcg will cure tuberculosis forever but so that exactly. didn't happen that Absolutely. didn't happen in right. many many parts of the world including india it was found that that this vaccine is not working and many countries have stopped using bcg vaccination because uh, they do not believe that it is working so bcg vaccine was created i don't remember maybe in the 1920s or something even today we do not know whether this vaccine is working or not so coming to your question that uh, it the the immunology of viral infection is another very intriguing story right now what we are considering is the antibody response that is how much of igg is being produced but the igg alone is not the end game you have to understand how uh, the viral you know interaction of the igg to the pathogen or the virus is not the end game you have to have the secondary response like the t cell response and all those kinds of things so there will certainly be some degree of variations from uh, from one person to another also you must remember uh, that vaccination could lead to some kind of an after effects also because if somebody is already having this uh, his this virus and you have a vaccine there can be a some kind of a hyper reaction to the situation which is what is happening in many people that immediately after vaccination uh, can you hear me yes sir please go ahead immediately after vaccination some people are falling extremely sick Uh, so <clears throat> we will have we'll need time to see uh, maybe another after four and five years we will know exactly right, how this vaccine has been useful but nevertheless this is the only thing we can do vaccinate people right, and try to right. control there is no other option right sir 
So I have one question, sir. I have one question. Like, if we see the uh, the curve, the worldwide curve of the infection, number of infection happening, number of, number of days that is available in uh, this uh, website. If you, you see her hump rising and then it is coming down and again it's rising in the second wave. So, like, is it something to do with the seasonal variation or the people who are being exposed to the virus or it is constantly mutating and uh, infecting a random people, bunch of people? I would say, I would say that uh, this is a natural uh, social behavior. So, social behavior. You know, it's, uh, you know, even in case of, uh, of um, social behavior, something not peculiar to human beings. If, even in animals and everybody, there is a social behavior. So whenever right. there is a threat perception, even the animals will go and, uh, you know, go into their home and sit. Right, okay. right. Uh, so, so, but then uh, when the threat perception goes away, they will come back. So these kinds of waves will keep on going on. And ultimately, we hope that the herd immunity sets in. Because once this second wave goes on, we'll again come out to the street and go to the colleges and we have to do it. We have no option. So you'll be expecting probably another wave. But in the meantime, either to herd immunity or to vaccination, if we can develop the resistance, uh, then that would probably be the only option. Unfortunately, we, have, we are losing so many of our friends and colleagues. This is, this is the very tragic part. But then to nature, uh, doesn't differentiate between you and me it doesn't differentiate between somebody who has a PhD or somebody who doesn't have a PhD. Uh, to nature, it is just a just a process that is going on where a virus is trying to infect people and trying right, to sir. survive. Right, sir. So, so that is very unfortunate very for well, all sir. of us. Yes, sir. But maybe we need to uh, do some thinking uh, rather than doing something very you know so out of impulse. Right, sir. Right, sir. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, sir. We have uh, come almost to the end of the session. Now, I would like to request uh, our professor Amor Chandra Dash Ghosh, the HOD of Department of Microbiology, to deliver the vote of thanks. Okay. We are grateful to Professor Tujay Kumar Das Gupta. Microbiology Department, Boston Institute, Kolkata, for providing its valuable time for us in highlighting the relevant information on viruses. I express my sincere gratitude to President, member of governing body, and also to Dr. Indranil Kaur, Principal Surendranath College, for inaugurating the second day of this three-day webinar on COVID-19, second wave evolution, risks, and vaccine. We are thankful to IQC coordinator, coordinator Dr. Suchanda Chatterjee and head of the Department of Molecular Biology, Dr. Nilan Sudars, for their sincere guidance. I am also thankful to my colleagues of the Department of Microbiology and other faculty members of Surendranath College for helping to organize this type of webinar series on such an important topic and allowing me to deliver the vote of thanks. I also express my thanks to Dr. Bernali Rai Basu and members of the Zoom technical team, without whose help we could not have organized this three-day webinar. Also thanks to all participants and my beloved students of Surendranath College, the non-teaching staff of this college. Always stay at home, wear masks, maintain safe distance, and obey the central government and state government rule for protection from COVID-19. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. So Thank this you brings, so much. Uh, this brings end of today's session. Uh, we will be bringing you another new session from the desks of scientists and physicians who are directly involved in the research of this deadly virus. So stay tuned and join us on the next Wednesday in our concluding webinar series. This is me, your host, Dev Deep, signing out. See you all in our next session on 26th May, right at 3 p.m. Thank you. So can I sign Thank out? You, sir. Thank you, sir. To all of you. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. It was a very, very nice session. I wish I could meet all of you personally someday very soon and uh, discuss with you all these issues. Okay. 
and good luck to all of you students and uh, you know everything will be fine very soon don't worry thank you sir thank you You ain't the good hooper.